Wow, uh, I, I did not realize I, I was that much of an instigator for the problem of an awesome conference in 2017. So I'm really proud to be the instigator for a problem like this. This is amazing. Um, so I, I actually, uh, I was in Hawaii two weeks ago at uh, JSConf Hawaii. Um, and, uh, and I remember thinking like, wow, this is, this is really cool. Um, one of the things I was thinking was like, wow, I really want to give a talk in like one of those shirts. And then I was like, hey, I'm going to be an Oslo. Why don't I just do it? Uh, <laughs> So here we are. Um, the other thing I remember thinking was like, this is like a conference in Hawaii. Like, how do you compete with that? And after this morning, I know the answer, s'mores. <laughs> so a uh, huge round of applause to the organizers because like really, <laughs> we're not that far into the day and already this conference rules. So um, without further ado, uh, let's, let's kick it off. So this is Exploring Elm SPA example. I'm Richard Feldman. Um, so we're going we're gonna to organize this into a, a few different uh, parts. First, we're going to give some background. Uh, so you may not know what the SPA example is. Don't worry. I'm going to go through that. Um, I'm going to talk about the module structure of the app. Just kind of walk through that and, uh, and like why things are organized the way they are. I'm going to talk about the dependencies. And uh, th there might be some surprises there as uh, some thoughts I have on like why certain dependencies are or are not included. And finally, I'm going to talk about reuse and scaling across the app. OK, so let's start with some background. Like, What is this thing? Um, so I used to get this recurring question like all the time. This is one of the most common questions I would get uh, from people who are asking things about Elm. Um, where can I find an open source example of an Elm single page application? Single page application, that is to say, an application where like Elm controls the routing, like the URL of the page. Um, and I used to always have to give this really um, unfortunate answer, which is like, sorry, <laughs> I only know about proprietary ones. Uh, Maybe you could ask one of them if you can see their code, um, which is not a great answer. Like You want to be able to just link people to something. Um, so what I linked them to instead was this small example, To Do MVC. If you're not familiar with To Do MVC, uh, basically it's this really, really simple app uh, that's a to-do list. And basically, you, you can type things into the box. Uh, so I typed in like make slides, pack a collared shirt to wear on stage, check. Uh, fly to Oslo and, and give the keynote. That one's not checked off because, you know, still in progress. I think we can agree. Um, and basically, that's the whole app. Uh, it's, it's really, really basic functionality. But the key thing is that they, they publish this really detailed spec on exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, and then people can implement it in a bunch of different technologies. Uh, so it used to be just for frameworks, and now it's also compiled to JS languages and other stuff, uh, you know, exotic combinations of things. And this is a great tool for learning by example. You can see the same code base, the same functionality implemented in different technologies. So you can kind of see, OK, here it is in this technology I'm familiar with. Here it is in one I'm unfamiliar with. And you can kind of use that as a tool for learning. Um, and this is actually how I learned Elm, uh, believe it or not. The to-do MVC uh, was, was sort of my way into Elm. Uh, back in July 2014, Evan wrote this blog post, Blazing Fast HTML with Elm. This is when Elm first got a virtual DOM. Before that, it had been sort of graphical. It was used for games. It had like Mario and stuff like that. Um, but it didn't actually have a virtual DOM yet until uh, Evan introduced one back then. Um, and he wrote uh, the to MVC example in Elm uh, based on this new virtual DOM thing and put it in the blog post. So I read about this and promptly went to the to MVC repo and, um, and there was this file, todo.elm, and that was the whole app. It was just this, this one single file. And uh, I, I went through that for this talk and man, I, I'm not gonna lie, I got a little emotional. Like it was, I, got, I felt like a lump in my throat just like rereading this code and be like, this is, this, is, this is like how I got into Elm. Um, and it like has become this hugely positive thing in my life. And I started with this thing called state. Um, today we call this model, but the, the name back then was state. Uh, so it was a record of you know, the, the application state. Um, and uh, this maybe uh, looks familiar to some people who are really old school, but uh, <laughs> quick show of hands, anyone remember fold P? Uh, yeah, okay, well, wow, that's, that's, so this kind of tells you how much Elm's been growing, is like, uh, like back in the day, that was just, everybody used that to, to start up your Elm application. It was fold over the past. There was this whole thing with signals, and like, don't worry, it's, it's not a thing anymore. Um, and then, uh, so you, you called all these functions, and then uh, you had this other function called scene, which was actually uh, not quite like what you use to render things. Uh, you used this function called render, which was called by scene, and render, maybe has a, a more familiar type signature, takes a state, which remember is now called model and returns HTML. This is what we now call view. Um, might also notice some other differences in here, like we have this colon equals thing uh, that I guess was for making tuples, and also properties and attributes had different incompatible types, and so there were like two lists of uh, arguments for those. So, you know, things have gotten more streamlined over the years. Um, but uh, this, this also will probably look a little bit familiar. Action to state to state. Uh, this is now what we call update. 
And of course, uh, the terminology has evolved. And uh, in Elm 0.15, uh, which came out in April 2015, so the previous one was July 2014, so this was not quite a year later, um, update uh, became the new name instead of step. And uh, it, it was still called action instead of message, uh, but now the, the, the model terminology sort of came into effect. Um, Elm 0.15.1 like a, has, a, has a special place in my heart. Um, does anyone remember what came out in 15.1? Oh, wow, nobody. Okay. Error messages. That was when Elm got good error messages. Um, prior to that, it was not known for that because they were just like, you know, everybody else's. Um, 15.1, Evan figured out, like, ways to make error messages really nice, and that was pretty much what all, all the release was about, and it was great. Um, apparently, I think uh, this was before my time, but I heard 0.9 was when it got types and, like, type inference, and before that, I just didn't have that. <laughs> so we've really, really come a long way. Um, Speaking of, of big jumps, uh, Elm 0.17 was the one that took out signals. Um, so this is the first time you see commands uh, as, as being introduced to update. Before that, you just never had a thing called commands. Um, and, uh, and, and then uh, we also got the terminology of message instead of action. Um, and, and you can still see, even, even 0.17, there's still some stuff that we don't have anymore. If you look down at the bottom there, there's that exclamation point operator. Um, how, many, how many people remember that thing? OK, a lot more, yeah. So. Um, yeah, and that was basically just a, a little bit of sugar for like returning a tuple of a, of a command. Um, so we can see that um, although things have gotten different names and maybe the types have shuffled around a little bit, fundamentally, like the, the basic idea of model, view, update with messages really has not changed. Um, I mean, since that initial like to-do MVC, it's basically been the same architecture the entire time, just with different names, slightly different types since 2014. So this is, this is almost five years old. Um, so it wasn't called the Elm architecture back then. Eventually, Evan added that name because he was like, I think this is just the architecture that emerges if you have Elm's design constraints. I think you're just going to end up here because it really seems like, I mean, we tried a bunch of different stuff in the signal era, um, and this was the thing that, that just we always kept coming back to. Um, and I think at this point, it's, it's safe to say that that was a good call because, I mean, this really has stuck. This is really kind of the, the fundamental architecture that, that makes sense with Elm. Um, okay, so I kept getting this recurring question. I only had to do MVC to point people to. Um, and, uh, and then I found out about this other thing, uh, the real world example apps. And uh, real world is similar to do, it, to do MVC, but kind of bigger in scope. Uh, its tagline is the mother of all demo apps. And <laughs> basically, uh, it, it is a single page app. Um, it has a, a bunch of different pages and features. It's, it's called Conduit. Uh, it's sort of a, a pun on medium. It's like a medium clone, kind of medium conduit. It's like a little English pun there. Um, and basically, the, the idea is that you can write articles or, or posts. Um, you can edit them. You can sign in, sign up. Uh, you can filter by tags. You can uh, follow people. You can favorite articles. You can see a feed of just your favorited things or the people you're following. Um, and so there's, there's a really solid amount of functionality there. Um, um, again, with a really clear spec and implemented in a bunch of different um, technologies, but in a way where you can actually see what does it look like to, to see something substantial implemented in these technologies, an actual single page application. Um, and this is great for me because um, they had a bunch of apps, examples on there already, so I could kind of look at like, oh, like, you know, uh, what, what's the functionality I need, like in addition to the spec and, and see how people were doing it. Um, and of course, they also had a back end just ready to go for me and styles ready to go. So all I had to do was implement the business logic on the front end. Um, so I did, and then uh, Elm uh, sort of entered this grid, and this was the, uh, the SPA example. Now I could finally link people to an example of how to <laughs> build an SPA in Elm that's open source. Um, so I wrote a blog post about this. Um, uh, you may or may not know, I'm actually a glacially slow writer. Um, <laughs> apologies to people who haven't gotten Elm in action yet, but it's almost done. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and this is like one of the few blog posts I've ever actually like shipped. Um, but uh, it basically explained like here's, you know, uh, here's what I, the decisions I made like with the initial version. And this talk is going to kind of follow up on that. Um, so uh, let's get into it. Let's, let's talk about uh, module structure first. Um, uh, a quick disclaimer is that like there is no way I can go through the entire app and like all of the decisions in this. Um, and the reason that I know that is because I ended up kind of doing that for front end masters uh, for in the advanced Elm course. Like a lot of the material in that course is just going through this app and explaining in a lot of detail like the examples. And it's like multiple hours, so there's no chance I'm going to fit that into 40 minutes, including the fact that I've already spent 10 minutes just explaining what all this is. So um, uh, if you want to get like a really really deep dive, uh, unfortunately that is like a thing you have to pay for. But um, if you're really really interested like that's a, a way that you can get that. So for this, I'm going to focus more on kind of like the big picture, um, kind of like breeze through these things and not really spend like a huge amount of time on each section because there's just not enough time to. Um, 
Big takeaway here is that the way the modules are structured are based on this talk, uh, the life of a file. Um, and Evan gave this talk at Elm Europe. Um, and uh, I'm going to dra dramatically oversimplify it and boil it down to uh, basically, for my purposes, he, he advised try building a module, like each module, around a particular type. Like find a type and then build a module around it. Think of an interface that, that module should have to expose or, or not that type to the world and, and how should those things uh, interact with the rest of your modules. So thinking more in terms of modules and modularity and interfaces than about files per se. Um, so here are the, um, the modules in the, uh, the page directory. So these are basically all of the, the pages in the app. So you have article, um, home, login, not found, profile, et cetera. Um, each of these corresponds to one of the different routes, roughly, um, on, the, on the page. It's not quite one-to-one, -one, um, but, but close enough. Um, I'm going to kind of just go, go through the login page as an example of how like, one of these modules is structured. Um, so pretty much all of them start off with model. Uh, I, just, I tend to go like uh, model is, is the first thing that, that appears in each of these modules. Um, each of these pages does have its own model view and update. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that pattern later on, but uh, that's something that I think in, in general is, is a good fit for single page apps, like giving each page its own model view and update. I never really tend to regret that. Um, and uh, so this is the login page's model. It has like, a session, which is sort of a shared uh, like application level state that, that each of the pages have. So this is things like uh, the current uh, logged in user, which I use the term viewer for currently logged in user because it's more concise. Um, problems refers to a list of form errors. So if I uh, typed in an invalid email address uh, when I was trying to log in or if I got a server error or something like that. And then finally, we have a form, uh, which, which represents the actual form data. Um, form is a record inside of a record, which is something I tend to avoid. Like, I tend to try and make things as flat as possible, unless in the specific case where I want to write functions that only accept that, that are only accepting that particular record, which is exactly what I ended up doing, for example, um, uh, as we will see in one of these view helpers. So this is the top level view. I, I put that after model. And down at the bottom there, you can see view form, which just takes a form and returns uh, the HTML that, that renders the form. A couple things to note about this page, um, so or, or this section. Uh, one is uh, view takes a model and returns title and content. So this being a single page app, um, I wanted to be able to set the, the title uh, dynamically depending on the page you're on. So for example, if you're viewing an article, I want to incorporate that article's title into the, uh, the title of the page. Um, a view problem is a, is a good example of uh, sort of narrowing your types. This is something I talk about in, a, in another talk, uh, which I'll link to a little bit later. Um, verbally linked to, I guess. Um, and uh, this is basically, uh, wh what's noteworthy here is that this is HTML with a lowercase m message, which is to say HTML that is inert. It doesn't do anything. It can't possibly uh, listen for any events, um, which means that I can just put at, at a glance looking at view problem tell you right now that it has no event listeners. It's not doing anything interactive, whereas the form uh, clearly is because it's got a capital M message, or at least it might be. OK, um, uh, so we, you notice that, uh, by the way, with both of these, uh, we have uh, this like double dash model at the top, this comment that says model, and then we have view here. Um, these are sort of headings. And this is like one of the things Evan talks about in Life of a File, is just like you don't need to use the file system as a way to organize things. You can just use headers like you would in a document and just say, like, OK, this is the part of the module where I'm talking about the model stuff. This is the part where I'm talking about view stuff. This is the part where I'm talking about update stuff. That's a perfectly reasonable way to organize your module. In fact, it's a really good way to organize your module, and I highly recommend it. Um, one thing to note about this one uh, is that uh, something I've gotten into uh, that I hadn't done with the previous version of the SPA example is um, past tense message names. So I really like the way these read, like especially in the debugger, um, is basically trying to answer the question, what happened, as opposed to sort of uh, an imperative form. Like, so instead of saying, like, set email, set password, I change it to, like, entry to email. Like, what happened? Oh, the user entered the email. You know, the user entered the password. Uh, they completed the login. We got the session back from the server, things like that. Um, subscriptions, uh, one thing to note about this, uh, this is a very short section because there's only one subscriptions function in here. Um, Session.changes, this is something that, that also changed. Uh, I wanted to make a single source of truth for whether or not the user is logged in. And I didn't want it to be something that was uh, I was managing in the model, but rather I wanted to react to it changing in local storage. So the way that this app works is you get an authentication token back from the server, which I call cred, short for credentials, and basically gets stored in uh, local storage. And then whenever you load the page, it gets read out of local storage and put in the session. So this session.changes subscription essentially says whenever local storage changes, like it's listening for events on local storage, fire this uh, subscription that says, OK, we, we've got a new update for the session. Like either the user has logged in or the user has logged out. 
Now, what's cool about doing this in a subscription is it means if I have multiple tabs open, since this is now the source of truth for whether or not I'm logged in, if I log out in one tab, all of the others get this event, and they immediately all become logged out. So when I go over to one of these other tabs, it says, oh, you're logged out. It's not stale. Um, likewise, if I log in, then I'll become logged in in the other tabs. And this was not true in the previous version. Um, so this is another example of, uh, of, of a technique that I like using, which is sort of trying to create uh, or like identify the best source of truth possible. In this case, I said, you know what? I think really the best source of truth for this is uh, the, the local storage rather than um, something that I'm just sort of caching in my model. Um, another header I have in this section is called form. So this is not model view updater subscriptions. This is just a, another header that I happen to have. I said, this is where the form stuff goes, which is a totally fine thing to do. Again, like these are headers like you would have in a document. Um, absolutely fine to, to you know, use whatever headings you want just to, to group, you know, to organize your module. So I wanted to, I had a bunch of form related stuff. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put that under the heading called form. Totally fine. Um, and finally, we have HTTP. Um, so this is where I put the HTTP stuff that is specific to the, uh, the login page. Um, one thing to note about this, I have not gotten around to updating this to the new uh, HTTP 2.0 package. So this is still using HTTP dot request. Um, I will probably get around to it at some point. It just hasn't really been a, a, a high priority for me. So it is still using HTTP dot request. But in the future, it presumably will be using uh, something else. OK, so that's the, the structure of the, uh, the page module, uh, or the, the modules uh, under page. Um, the rest of the app has a very, very flat structure. So almost all of the other modules are just in the top level directory. It's like API, article, asset, all of these things um, are, are all just kind of top level. One thing worth noting about these, uh, comment ID, username, uh, those are things like, uh, they're essentially identifiers, and I gave them their own module so that I could make comment ID and username um, opaque. Uh, slug is another example of that, um, article slug. Uh, I did put article slug in the article subdirectory because I actually do have quite a few things that relate only to article. And again, I don't think the names of these files are nearly as important as the, uh, the, the, the actual interface behind each of them. Um, so I, ha I had one thing in the API folder, uh, endpoint, uh, which we'll get into uh, now. So uh, the endpoint uh, abstraction is essentially a way of, of saying, I want to control uh, which URLs are uh, visible into the app. And the reason I want to do this is I want to try and prevent myself from making silly mistakes. Um, rather than hard coding constants, you know, it's, it's considered better practice to put them in one place and like, give them a name and assign them to something, um, uh, rather than like, having magic strings in various places. And this is kind of taking that one step further and saying, actually, not only am I going to do that, but I'm going to make it so that um, a lot of my HTTP logic is built around only being able to talk in terms of these endpoints that I have explicitly enumerated that I know are valid endpoints for my app, rather than our arbitrary strings. Um, so it all uh, sort of like boils down to this endpoint type. And you can see it's type endpoint equals endpoint string, which means this is a custom type with only one variant, uh, which only holds a string. That's all it does. And I have this unwrap function, which I use as a convenience inside this module, but neither the endpoint variant nor unwrap are exposed, which is to say that this is an opaque type. Um, Again, don't have time to go into a full thing on opaque types here, but, but I already gave a talk about them um, called Make Data Structures. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, definitely recommend that talk. Um, at the end here, we have this uh, URL function, which is the way that uh, you get an endpoint. And uh, this is also not exposed, because essentially what I'm using it for as, is as a convenience inside this module to define all of the different endpoints that I know are valid API endpoints according to my spec. So I've got like a login endpoint, I've got a user endpoint. And internal to this module, yeah, this is where the strings live. This is where I know, you know, okay, I'm, I'm putting together these strings. Um, but outside this module, the rest of the app is just dealing in terms of these opaque endpoints and really can't mess these up. If anything's going to go wrong with any of these strings, it's going to be inside this one module. So I just kind of like reduced the, the surface area of potential problems with URL strings down to one single module. And I've used the type system to make sure that I cannot introduce problems inside any other module. Um, the key to sort of like propagating that guarantee across the rest of the app is this request function. And this is essentially a carbon copy of the HTTP.request function from like the Elm slash HTTP package. Um, with one exception, I have changed uh, the type of URL. So it no longer takes like a normal URL string, but rather it takes one of these opaque endpoints. And in all other respects, this is exactly the same as that uh, request. I basically just copied and pasted it and tweaked it for this, which is blasphemous depending on who you talk to. You're not supposed to copy paste code. You know, you'd think I'd been just started programming yesterday. But um, actually, in this case, this is, uh, this is I think, a really great way to make sort of like a, a bespoke thing that works almost like this other thing, but with a really, really key difference. 
And then I use this custom request, because request is sort of the underlying, uh, the, the way to do an HTTP request in a fully customized way. I use it to build out customized versions uh, that are sort of bespoke to my application for get, put, post, and delete. And each of them takes an endpoint instead of a URL. So as long as for the, you know, with the rest of my application, I'm just using get, put, post, and delete, uh, along with those uh, endpoints that I've hard coded to be only valid endpoints, um, I no longer have to worry about never having like, malformed URLs or, or, or you know, incorrect strings, uh, because I've sort of condensed this all down to this one place. The other thing that's cool about this is I've also incorporated what is the particular uh, authentication level that I need, depending on which thing I'm doing. So gets potentially need credentials, potentially not, but puts always need credentials. Like it's a rule of this API on the back end that anytime I'm doing a put, it's going to have to be something that uh, takes credentials with it. I know that that's like one of the, the uh, requirements of the API. So why not put that into this type? Now there's no way that the Elm HTTP package is going to put that requirement into its type because that's like way too broad. Like not every application has that, but this particular one does. So this means that by putting this in my type right here and by the virtue of the fact that I'm always going to use API.put rather than the one from the HTTP package, um, I can be really confident that I'm never going to accidentally get like a, you know, a 401 or a 403 from like having not specified credentials uh, when I was supposed to. It just wouldn't compile if I forgot to give it credentials. So I think this is, this is sort of an underrated idea, this idea of taking an existing, like, well, commonly understood package and then just, just making it a little bit customized for your particular application then using this customized version everywhere in order to just get guarantees for really pretty cheap. It's like, yeah, there was a little bit of copying and pasting on the road to here, but totally worth it if you ask me. Okay, um, this is what it looks like to actually use one of those things. Um, the, the actual like helpers for like, here's how to do a login, here's how to uh, make an update to the settings page are all extremely short. They're just uh, essentially one line, although I formatted it as two lines for the slide. It's like, post or put, uh, give it the endpoint that I want, so endpoint.login, give it the credentials or nothing if there are no credentials needed, give it the body that I'm going to send off, and then talk about how to decode it. Um, so it's all really concise to sort of add one of these. Like if I needed to add a new you know, API endpoint, basically all I would do, because I'd already built up all this other machinery, is I'd do something just like this. It'd really be just a little one-liner function um, that would give me back the, the request. OK, so that's sort of like what I'm getting from, from all of this uh, request and endpoint machinery uh, is, is a lot of guarantees around uh, my code. And this is sort of a recurring theme of the, the changes that I made from um, going to 18 to 19. They really didn't have anything to do with like the Elm release. It was just, to be perfectly honest, while, while I was in the process of upgrading it from Elm 18 to Elm 19, I just got kind of carried away. And I was like, wow, I just have all these ideas I want to try out um, based on stuff that I've you know, learned in the interim. And I just uh, kind of went with it. And a lot of the stuff that I ended up with is stuff where I was like, wow, this is really nice. Um, I, I, I feel like uh, you know, this, is, this is something we should start using at work. And um, some of these ideas are things that we ended up using at work. Um, in particular, like our, we, we did the, like, a discussion on like, hey, should we be using like opaque IDs, like um, comment ID and like username? And we were like, yeah, seems like a good idea. And we started using it. So um, this is like a, an example of, I think, uh, sometimes you know, you, if you're doing a side project, it can be something that ends up like revealing things to you, or you end up um, trying things out and discovering that like, oh, this is really nice, and then you can take it back to work um, and, and share it with people. OK, um, let's talk about dependencies. So uh, Elm 19 introduced this awesome new feature of dead code elimination and made it so that uh, basically the, the cost of adding a new dependency was really reduced. Like it was no longer as, as big a deal for your bundle size, which means, of course, that we should now add all the dependencies. Like it's, ah, it's free. I'll take one of these, and one of these, and one of these, and one of these. Um, or maybe not, um, because bundle size is not really the only thing uh, that, that you know, impacts whether or not it's a good idea to add a dependency. Um, I saw this great tweet recently. I'm calling for an end to holy war against code duplication. Time teaches all of us, the vast majority of the time, duplication is preferable to dependency. I wouldn't go that far. Um, I don't know about the vast majority of the time, but I think um, more often than we think. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of like underrated, I guess. Um, Evan likes to say uh, there's a difference between things being similar and things being the same. And it's, it's actually really easy, I think, in programming to, to say, well, these are so similar, I want them to be the same, so I'm going to make them be the same. Then it ended up accidentally making the code worse. Um, but I wouldn't go as far as he would. But uh, he got a response from uh, Joe Armstrong on Twitter, uh, the creator of Erlang. If you're not familiar with Erlang, um, Erlang is a system that he created uh, at Ericsson. And uh, it has a, a pretty interesting claim to fame, which is 
There was an application they built with Erlang. Over the course of 20 years, it's had nine nines of uptime. That is not a typo. Um, that is actually how much uptime they had over two decades of running. Um, I have never made any software nearly that reliable. <laughs> uh, maybe some of you in the audience have. Um, but I, I think that this means that Joe Armstrong, at, at this point, uh, has some credibility in the realm of what does it take to make reliable, maintainable software over the long term. Um, and his response to this very strong claim, like duplication is preferable to dependency the vast majority of the time, Joe's response was, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> which surprised me. Um, he went on to say, uh, I try to write code with zero dependencies, like no packages. Just, just don't, even, don't even do it. Just do it all yourself. Um, again, not as far as I would go. Um, but maybe, maybe I'm just like, maybe I'll get there, you know? <laughs> Uh, or maybe I'm just not on his level. Um, code I wrote 25 years ago with zero dependencies still works today. I was not writing code 25 years ago. Um, code I wrote five years ago with external dependencies often fails. Now that last sentence definitely resonates with me. Um, I, I think that's that's something maybe we've all experienced is like you know we, we over time our code becomes unreliable because of stuff we've depended on. Um, Okay, so the conclusion is clearly we should drop all the dependencies. Uh, not, not, not add them, just throw them all in the trash and, and you know, try to code with zero dependencies. Uh, but I think, I mean, where I end up on this, uh, you know, after like, thinking about this a lot, is really just I, I want to raise the bar for adding a dependency. Um, I think my time with JavaScript really taught me, and this is, I think, a big cultural thing in JavaScript, is just like never reinvent any wheel. Like if you, if you need a thing and someone wrote that one-liner, like import that one-liner and now you depend on that and that's good. Uh, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that's actually not good um, and, and that's not something we should do. Um, so here's my elm.json or, or part of it for, uh, for the elm SPA example. Um, a lot of this stuff right here, all of the elm packages, this is really like, these are sort of required features like elm happens to organize them in packages so they can be versioned independently. Um, I'm not really losing any sleep over adding these as dependencies like I need HTTP, I'm going to add the HTTP package. Um, but these are the other ones. These are the sort of the optional ones that I could have written myself um, but which I, I chose to use a package for. Um, so markdown because this uh, needs markdown. I don't think writing a markdown parser yourself is like probably a good use of time. Um, JSON decode pipeline, um, I really like that anytime I have like any number of like large uh, records to decode, which is exactly what we have in this application. I think it's why it's a commonly used dependency. Um, and finally, ISO 8601 date strings. Um, this is a package that just does that. <laughs> it does nothing else but deal with ISO 8601 date strings, which is what uh, the real world backend provides. So basically I was like, I'm going to get this down to the bare minimum of stuff where I'm like, this is just uh, unreasonable for me to do myself and really nothing else. And I was really surprised by um, how much that exercise improved the application, like improved the code base. Um, so some of the things that I trimmed out included Elm Validate, which <laughs> this is the first package I ever published, the first Elm package. Um, ended up cutting it. Uh, and actually, I ended up concluding I probably will never use it again. <laughs> um, so maybe another way to think of it is I kind of realized, that, like after all the years that have you know passed since I first published it, that maybe I didn't need to publish it in the first place. And I think I've actually like grown. I, <laughs> I, I maybe that's a good thing. Um, I, I shouldn't be sad about. Um, select list. This was a package that I sort of like created um, in the course of uh, building the the first version of the SPA example, and um, sort of like intentionally made more general than it needed to be, so that I could publish it as a package, which I now realize was silly. Um, why would I do that? Uh, and in fact, I ended up cutting it out and replacing it with something that was less general and therefore nicer for this application. Um, Elm HTTP builder, um, I ended up replacing that with the request thing. But actually, I ended up discovering the request thing because I was like, what if I didn't have this HTTP builder dependency? What would I do instead? I actually ended up with something that I was way happier with. So that was definitely a win. Um, Elm date format, I'm embarrassed to admit that I ended up taking this out and realizing that I only needed one handwritten function to replace the entire package. Um, so I really was not using it for that much, really did not need an entire dependency for that. Um, and finally, after I'd taken all these other things out, I realized that I wasn't using JSON extra anymore because I'd only been using it for ISO 8601 date parsing. So um, really just was able to drop that for free. So in summary, uh, Elm Validate got replaced with sort of more obvious code for validation. Like now I can look at it and be like, oh, there's no call out to third party stuff. It just does what it says. Great. Um, select list became paginated list. HTTP builder got replaced with this nicer API. This got replaced with one function, and uh, JSON extra was just um, superfluous. Now, one thing I, I think about in terms of trade-offs with dependencies is reliability. So a common thing that I'll hear is like, hey, don't reinvent the wheel. Like, the wheel works. You know, you, you don't need to come up with the other thing. You're probably not going to come up with a better wheel, which in a lot of cases is, is a valid point to make. Um, and another thing that people say is, you know, when you 
get a dependency, you get all their tests for free, which is also a valid point to make. Um, but there's another thing to, to make here to consider, which is like, how many of you have had this experience? You know, you're looking at a package and then like something is kind of going weird and then you look at the code and you're like, what, what is this? What, what, is, what have I uncovered here? Um, and you, you kind of like realize that, that like what you've been depending on all this time is this kind of frightening. Um, I've definitely discovered that. And, and sometimes it's like weird or bad implementation choices, but sometimes it's much worse. Um, Packages have risks. Uh, they can have attacks. They can have vulnerabilities. We recently saw this on NPM, um, this event stream incident. Um, not going to get into the details of this. Basically, someone managed to get con someone malicious managed to get control of a package and use it to attack somebody else that depended on that package, and which was a Bitcoin app, uh, to try and steal money out of people's Bitcoin wallets. And they they succeeded at like getting it in. Um, uh, Hillel Wayne wrote up a really, really extensive analysis of this whole event, if you're uh, curious about the details, but not going to go into the there here, just uh, sort of uh, point to his blog post. Okay, um, one thing to note about this is like, when you're depending on a package in Elm, unlike an NPM, um, you have the types uh, that are sort of like telling you what can this package do. So if you're worried about somebody like doing malicious HTTP things, you don't actually need to worry about that for like every single package you depend on. It really depends on what their types are doing. So like if I'm looking at like, you know, date format, like that's just dealing with strings. Like that's not really capable of doing HTTP stuff. Like if I, uh, if somebody tried to maliciously insert an HTTP request that was going to try and steal stuff out of Bitcoin wallets, it wouldn't compile anymore. It'd be like a task instead of a string. I'd be like, what? Um, so that'd be really hard to sneak in. However, I did have a dependency on something that was doing HTTP normally. Now, I tr trust Luke Westby like as an author. I'm not worried that Luke is going to do a malicious attack. But what happened with EventStream was basically the original author ended up saying, hey, I don't want to spend time maintaining this anymore, handed it off to someone else. Now, hopefully, if Luke decided to hand this off to someone else, it would be someone he trusts. But what if that person later on hands it off to someone that they don't trust as much? And that person, like trust can erode over time, and you don't necessarily realize that that's happening anymore. Um, so, you know, just by virtue of the fact that I'm depending on this library and trusting it to do stuff with HTTP means that this, you know, anybody who gets control of this package can potentially inject stuff into my HTTP. So when I realized this, I was like, wow, I don't know if I'm ever going to depend on any, like, HTTP helper library ever again. I'm just going to write it by hand. I mean, it's, it's just like, honestly, what is the, like, is the, is the convenience of, like, saving a couple of lines of code, like, really worth that risk? I would rather just sleep better at night, to be honest. Um, so I've kind of like rethought that uh, in light of this event because, to be perfectly honest, I think the trend is going to be that we're going to start seeing more of these attacks over time than less. Um, now again, I'm not saying never ever added dependencies for any reason. That is definitely not the point that I'm making here. The point that I'm making is to raise the bar for adding a dependency. And, and sort of by extension, um, to think about as I did with select list and Elm validate, like maybe also raise the bar for publishing a package. Like think, you know, not only is this something that I would use in my own project, like if it were third party, but also just like, do I need to publish this or is this something that like is just for my app and uh, it's not actually something general purpose? These are questions that I, I've started asking myself more than I did um, when I published the first version of this. And finally, we come to uh, reuse and scaling. Um, so I gave a whole talk about uh, scaling LMAPs uh, in uh, 2017. And um, one of the things that I, I talked about was that anytime I find myself saying, I want to build something reusable, like some piece of my app that I'm going to reuse across multiple sections, um, the first question I ask is, what should its API look like? Because in Elm, you have a different answer depending on the situation. This is sort of a really key part of scaling Elm apps and, and of reuse. Um, so I gave some examples in that talk, uh, which came from the original Elm SPA example. So I had like a view timestamp, which took an article and, and returned some HTML. Um, and then like uh, article.view, which was sort of like a, a bigger example. This is like a little bit more complex API. Uh, this took a function that uh, took an article and returned a message. So I called this the like teach me how to message technique. Um, and then uh, took an article and returned some HTML. Um, I also had a feed, which was an entire like nested, it had its own model and view and update, which is like the most complex API um, of all the examples that I gave. Um, so it had its own view and then also its own uh, update for, uh, for ma managing its own sort of like internal state. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I, I also talked about was sort of these like broader example API, so sort of like generalizing this. So I talked about like a subscribe button is kind of the simplest API you can have. It's just HTML, it's not even a function. Um, maybe you'd have a, a badge that takes the user and, and returns HTML, or a checkbox, which does the teach me how to message thing. Or maybe you'd finally say like, okay, I really need uh, this, this like idea of internal state, its own model view and update, um, and that's the way to go. 
Um, and uh, I want to point out that these are sort of techniques, uh, not dependencies, right? These are not things like, in neither version of the SP example was I like importing a like helper package for doing these. These are just like kind of ways that you know to work with the tools that you get from the normal Elm HTML package. Um, there really, I don't think, is any need to install any additional packages to work with these. I think those tools are not just good enough, but actually optimal. I, I think they're sort of like the tools that I, I like to use the most. Um, and I give sort of the counter example of like another way you can go with this and, and a way that I personally have done in the past and was very unhappy with um, is to try and give them all exactly the same API and to say like no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to treat this like a component in React and say like it's going to have a model view update triplet for every single thing in my application. Um, and I basically said like I, I no longer, uh, <laughs> having tried this and, and uh, having seen others try this and report uh, un unhappiness with it um, a lot, uh, I, I don't recommend doing this. I don't recommend using the most complex of those APIs in all situations, but rather using the simplest API uh, that gets the job done in each particular situation. Um, and uh, I, I, I've heard a question um, a couple of times over the years, and actually like pretty recently even, uh, of someone saying like, hey, if, if this nested model view update thing is bad, how come you use it in the SPA example? Like, you use it for the pages. They have their own model view and update. And like, the feed has its own model view and update. So like, if it's bad, then like, why are you using it? And I want to like, clarify that uh, it's not that it's bad. It's not bad. It's, it's just that that particular tool is heavyweight. And I think it's better to try and pick the simplest API that gets the job done in each situation. And I thought of a, an interesting metaphor um, for this uh, recently that, uh, that I want to share. Um, so let's say you're, you're sitting down at a restaurant. And uh, you know, pretty standard, every restaurant you go to, or at least like the vast majority of them, are going to have a place setting that looks something like this. You're going to have a knife, a fork, and a spoon. And these are sort of the tools that you work with to you know, solve the problem of eating your meal. So let's say I order like soup and a salad and some chicken. And I'm like, OK, uh, I'm going to think about like, how am I going to proceed with solving the problem of, of uh, eating this meal. So first, you got the soup, right? And I'm like, all right. Which, what, which combination of tools am I going to use to eat the soup? So I could be like, all right, uh, I brought some props. Um, I figured they wouldn't let me take a metal version of this on the plane, so uh, we've got plastic props. Um, I could be like, I'm going to use this knife to eat this soup. Uh, probably, probably not going to be a great fit, like not, not ideal. Um, so I might, I might go with the fork, right? Uh, fork I think would work better than knife. I think we can agree. Um, a little more surface area, but it's still like the stuff's going to fall through. Like I could kind of, you know, spear some like vegetables if you like a little bit better, but really not a great experience. I think, I think consensus would probably be spoon is the way to go. I hope we can all agree um, with, with the soup. Uh, I think that's just like the right tool for the job. And I also don't think it's better if I use like multiple of these. I think really just the spoon for the soup is the way to go. Um, now, but with the salad, though, this is like a different situation, right? This is a different problem, different use case. Um, with the salad, I would not go spoon. Like, you got the lettuce things, like, it's just going to fall off. It's going to be a disaster. Um, it's just not the right tool. Like, the different tools, you know, they have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, I actually think knife would be better than spoon. Like, you could at least spear some lettuce things. And then, like, you know, I, but, but still, like, really, I mean, this is, like, this is what fork was built for. Come on. I mean, like, this is... Fork, and again, like maybe if I had like really long pieces of lettuce, I might get the knife involved, but, but most salads, and certainly this salad, I'm just going fork. All right, now chicken, okay, so chicken's a little more complicated because with chickens, first of all, I mean, we can rule out spoon immediately. Have you ever tried to spoon chicken? Like, not, not a thing, not a thing. Um, oh, how, I just realized how that sounds. Um, <laughs> so definitely don't spoon chicken. If there's one takeaway from this talk, um, so like it's just it's just not effective as a tool. Um, now I think I think uh, if you just use fork, uh, that that'll work better than spoon. But like especially for the bigger pieces, like you know you're kind of like scraping it off there. It's not not really great. Now you could say okay now finally we get to use the knife. But like knife by itself is not actually that great because you know the chicken's going to wobble around. It's going to be a problem. Really, I think the answer for chicken is you want to use fork plus knife. Like you want to use both of them. Um, now this is a little bit more heavyweight. This is a little more complex than the other ones we chose. Right? We have to use two. Have to get two hands involved. Um, but at the end of the day. I claim this is the optimal like choice to use for each of these things, and like it's not better if I get more of them involved. Now, like depending on who you ask, you might say, okay, well, you know, you could think of this as like composition, right? I could break this down and I could say, really, like if you if you take a step back and you look at each of these dishes, a dish is essentially like a sort of sub meal. It's like a meal within a meal. And so really you could just use like all of the utensils with all of the dishes and essentially just go down and say like, okay, this is how I'm going to eat the soup and then I'm going to eat the salad with all of the things and I'm going to eat the chicken with all of the things. 
But unless you're Wolverine, like I really don't think this is, this is gonna be a better experience than doing it with like the simplest tool for each job. Um, so that's kind of the point that, that like I, I'm trying to get across. Um, and you know, also like use props because props are fun. But, uh, but basically like this is, this is how I think about it. It's like doing this is essentially, it's, it's actively worse than doing the simpler version of this. Like you're just gonna have a better time if you take the time to think about like, what, which of these tools in my toolbox, which of these techniques is actually gonna be the best fit for the problem I'm trying to solve? To tie this into the previous section a little bit um, uh, about like techniques and not dependencies, um, there is a, a, another thing that kind of happens, um, not as frequently, but I definitely have seen it happen, where you kind of, uh, and this is definitely a trap, I've fallen into so many times, um, where I'll look at this and I'll say, hang on, hang on. So like, we're using just spoon for soup, and we're using just fork, for lettuce, but for chicken, we're using two utensils. That is a code smell. Uh, that, that should not be true. Like, it's inconsistent, right? Like, everything should be the same in programming. So uh, how can I fix this? Like, there's got to be some way that I can make it so that instead of having two utensils for the chicken thing, I can, <gasps> <laughs> I've made an abstraction. <laughs> Fork knife. I'm gonna publish a package, I'm gonna write a blog post, streamlining the Elm architecture with fork knife, Elm fork knife. Um, and then I'm gonna get a gazillion GitHub stars. Uh, it's gonna be amazing. Um, uh, hopefully, I, I now know better that I will never do this. I can't promise that I won't, but, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, this is, this is like, I think, kind of a trap. Uh, like, a, a lot of times, it's like, look, I mean, this has been the same architecture since 2004. Like, these primitives have been really, really vetted at this point. Um, these are essentially the, like, bread and butter utensils that you get when you sit down at every restaurant. Like, this is what you get when you sit down to make an LMAP for a reason. Like, if you know how to use them, like, they actually combine together really, really well. Like, there's a reason you don't see fork knife at this table. Um, it's not that the restaurant people, like, never thought of it. And, like, it's, it's this amazing discovery waiting to improve restaurants everywhere. Um, it's really just that it's, like, this is actually better. Um, so I think, uh, especially when you think about, like, something that's, like, as old and as fundamental as this, uh, I, I think the bar becomes even higher for publishing a package or, or thinking about, like, oh, hang on, am I actually, like, doing this better or, or does this, like, seem cool and it, but maybe I'm solving a problem that like actually shouldn't be solved in this way. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we went through a couple of different steps here. We talked about uh, background, like single page app, uh, uh, like the motivation and like where that came from. We talked about the module structure of the app, we talked about dependencies and how like maybe we should raise the bar for including dependencies and actually some cool stuff that can come out of taking out dependencies. And we talked about um, uh, reuse and scaling. So we, uh, in, in the case of to-do MVC and real-world example app, uh, these were great examples of, of learning by example. Um, we talked about sort of the, the history of to-do MVC and, uh, and some of the old signal stuff and fold P and whatnot. Um, but, but really fundamentally, I mean, in a lot of these cases, the names have changed, but a lot of the stuff has really just stayed very, very much the same architecturally. Um, talked about the life of a file and how uh, that sort of guided the, the module structure of the app. Um, went through each of the pages and kind of the different sections with the different headings rather than splitting things out into multiple files. Um, talked about sort of a generally pretty flat uh, module structure for the rest of this um, and uh, having like individual like comments ID identifiers and username being in their own module so they can have opaque types. Um, we talked about uh, how you know opaque types can be an awesome thing and you know linked to this other talk, verbally linked to this other talk um, that, that gives more detail about them. Talked about the risks of importing packages like event stream and um, how you know the, the consequences can actually be more severe than a package author making decisions I wouldn't have made. They could actually be actively malicious. This is like a real thing we have to think about now. Um, and in particular, packages that have to do with effects, um, and, and effects that we might not uh, want someone else to, to sort of control in our application. Um, I talked about uh, sort of trimming out uh, a lot of these packages and ending up with, in all cases, uh, code that I was happier with as a result of removing this dependency. I ended up removing all of them. I mean, I, I still did end up having three sort of third-party dependencies, um, but they were really carefully chosen list after I went through this exercise. Um, and the conclusion was sort of raise the bar for adding a dependency, and in fact, even also for publishing a package. Um, if you'd like to know more about like uh, a lot of the individual techniques in here, like I said, way too much time to fit into a talk. I'm already a little over on time. Um, but if you uh, if you want to go through like a really in-depth thing, I spent several hours recording video on this for Frontend Masters. So if you have a Frontend Masters subscription, check that out. 
Um, and uh, finally, we talked about uh, reuse and scaling. Um, we talked about the like, if I want to build something reusable, first think about like, what should its API look like? What are the tools and techniques I should use uh, to to make to solve just this problem? Um, using you know, I, I think techniques are, are better than dependencies in this case, and there are quite a few nice techniques available. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right one for the job and not using the most complex API in all the situations. Even though sometimes, like in the case of SPA pages or something really complex like the feed that's getting reused, um, it is called for, just not using it as sort of like the, the hammer to hit every nail with. Thanks very much.